Kelvin. You can come and sing together. Starting with him, number 647, SDH. The second song is Marching to Zion, 422, SDH. Mine eyes have seen the glory. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the preps of wrath are torn. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible sweet word. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, alleluia. Glory, glory, alleluia. His truth is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is lifting out the hearts of men before the judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, alleluia. Oh, glory, glory, alleluia. And glory, glory, alleluia. Alleluia. His truth is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea. With the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me As he died to make me holy, let us live to make me free Well, God is marching on Those of you that love sermons with titles like I do, eighth son or son number eight, eight wives, one God. A fight that ended before it had even begun. And I want to preach from the book of uh, First Samuel chapter 17. Because there's a- then before I can read from that passage, Allow me to give you a backdrop to the whole scenario, reading from chapter 16 and reading on verse 7. And I'm using a very contemporary version. It's called Message. It's used by young people. It's so good for young people. And it says on verse 7 of chapter 16, verse somewhere, looks aren't everything. Don't be impressed with his looks and stature. Men and women look at the face. God looks into the heart. I don't know what your version is saying, but that's message version. It says, I'll do it again. Looks aren't everything. Don't be impressed with his looks and stature. Men and women look at the face, but God 
looks into the heart. Now, Samuel is a bridge between the judges and the kings because he was actually the last judge to rule over Israel as a judge. Before they cried for kings, God had mandated that they use judges. And so Samuel transits from being a judge into being a prophet because his role as a leader is being taken over by somebody else. So he spearheads the coronation of the first king of Israel called Saul. But then Saul fell out of favor with God. He began to consult mediums. He began to do things contrary to the will of God. And God told Samuel, prepare for another king. One of the eight children of Jesse is going to be the second king of Israel. And God tells Samuel, go and anoint him. And Samuel says, God, how can I put my life on the edge of a knife? How can I go and anoint another king when the king is still alive? And God said, you know what? Go in the pretext of doing a sacrifice. And as you do the sacrifice, you will anoint that man or that boy. So, Jesse had eight sons, the firstborn being Eliab. He came and God said, no, not that one. Then Amidab came and God said, no, not that one. And Shama came. God said, no, 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 not even that one. That is when that text comes into play. When God says, don't look at his face. Don't, don't be overtaken by the looks. Do not be deceived by the looks. Because when, when, when Samuel looked at uh, Eliab, he looked in stature like one that could be a king. But God said, no, 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 I have not chosen him. I have refused him. And all the seven sons bypassed him. And they were done. Then God says, I'm still waiting for one. And then he asks the father. He says, is there anyone else? He was asked, can you bring all your sons? He brought seven of them. And when they all bypassed the altar, and none of them was picked up by God. And then Samuel asked him, he says, is there anyone? And then the father says, there remains yet the youngest, and he is keeping the sheep. There remains the youngest, and is keeping the sheep. Now, you see, in the Hebrew connotation, in the context of the Hebrew language, when he said that, he was saying, he is the least. He is the weakest. I'm not thinking of him to be here. Now, you see, in their context, he says he is looking after the sheep. Deliberately, he made David, the eighth son, to take care of the sheep as an instrument to keep him out of trouble. Did you see that? It's like you have a very troublesome child. A child that keeps on taking people's things, you know. So what you do is you keep him busy with the remote. So that he does not get diverted. He does not go to disturb other people's kids. So David is taken to look up to the few sheep for the sake of keeping him in check. He is not somebody is like looking up to say he, he, something great can come out of him. So he's made him look after the sheep to just stay put. It was an aid just to put him in control. So the boy does not misbehave. And you see, last bones sometimes are pampered more than the other children. If you are the last born, you know what I'm talking about. Even when you marry, your parents will still treat you like you're not yet married. Even when you have your own children, your parents will treat you like you're still a baby and those children you have are just child play. And this happens all the time. 
David was the last born. And you see, I love preaching from his biography because I can read well with David. When I look at what David went through, I feel like I have been there myself. I, I don't relate well with Joseph because Joseph ran away from sin, you remember? I have many times run into sin. Uh, I don't preach from Elijah so much because Elijah one time went up to heaven. I have been in hell several times and God has snatched me out of hell. I, I don't preach so much from Joshua because Joshua was a man of faith. He went seven times around Jericho because myself, each time I'm in, in the presence of giants, my faith falters and shrinks into something like a grasshopper. So I love preaching from David because his life story and mine kind of relate. I don't know about you. Now, I'm not trying to posit some apology, apologistics here, like apology, uh, some expression of defending something. Apologetics. I'm trying to just simply talk about this theology about God's grace it, as he said, God's riches at Christ's expense. I'm trying to preach something that kind of tells us that God's grace is consistent. And that from Genesis to Revelation, God has been driving the point home, the point of grace, that we are nothing on our own saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. And so I love preaching from David's point of view. Because at that moment, when he was the last born, a powerless fellow, at that moment, God prevailed in his life. I heard you people sing, but I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy power of hand. Now, he is the weakest link in the family, and God lifts him up. That's number one. Number two. David married seven, eight wives. Eight wives. Eight wives. If one wife can really stress you, just one wife. Now, this gentleman married eight. You know, the women that nag, I don't know if you married to one, but there are women that can nag right in the kitchen, in the sitting room. They'll follow you up to the bedroom. And when you try to calm them down, you're like, baby, I'm sorry. They say, I understand your sorry. You are about to shut me up. And you say, baby, don't baby me. And so the gentleman just goes to the bathroom, <laughs> closes the door. She comes by the door and says, hey, what the hell are you doing in there? I'm talking to you and you're trying to ignore me. Women sometimes can knock. And you can be stressed. Now imagine a man that marries eight wives. Eight. That when he was dying, the Bible says in First King 1 verse 1, he died a lonely man, an old man. None of those eight wives could come and warm him in his bed. The man his men, his assistants, had to look for a virgin girl and brought her to bed to keep him warm. At that weakest moment of his life, at that weakest moment of his life, the Bible in Acts 13, verse 22, declares David as a man after God's own heart. A fight that ended before it had even begun. It's like fights started as way back as from the gladiators, the Trojans, and the Olympics. I'm too back to the time when I, I just grew up into a boy and my father gave me the privilege to be with him in the sitting room, to wait for the boxing fights that were happening in the United States of America. So you'd be there waiting at zero one in the morning. So dad would brew some tea 
so that we are kept awake. But I remember too well of a fight, the shortest fight of this boxer. It was on July 26, 1986, a fight between Mavis Frazier and Iron Mike Tyson. So we were there in the sitting room, me and my dad, waiting for that fight. I could doze off a bit, you know, kick me up and say, man, come on, let's push, let's push. And when the time came, I remember too well, I dozed a bit, I'm like that, you know, as they do the introductions and all the preliminaries, let me try just to cut some sleep. But unfortunately, in the third seconds of the first round, Frazier was knocked down by Mike Tyson. And that was Mike Tyson's shortest boxing fight. Third seconds, the fight was over. Probably if there were people in the queue catching into the stadium, they must have missed it. If you never watched it that day and then you are watching it on YouTube, you try to fast forward 30 seconds, you find the fight is over. And if there were people in that auditorium that had gone to the rooms of convenience, by the time they came back, they were told the fight is over. Let me tell you something. There was a fight in the Bible that started and it ended before it had actually even started. That fight is found in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. Reading on verse 1 to 11. It's quite a long passage. That's where my message is coming from. 1 Samuel, I'm using the New King James Version. 1 Samuel chapter 17 reading on verse 1 now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Soko which belongs to Judah they encamped between Soko and Ezekiel in Ephes Demim and so and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in the battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath, from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had bronze helmet on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze and he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his, sh his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his iron spear, spearhead weighed 600 shekels and shield bearer went before him. And his two and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you servants of Saul, choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. Verse 9, if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then he will be your servant. And then we'll be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and save us. Verse 10. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Maybe let me go up to 12 so that I don't come back to this passage. And 12 says, now David was the son of Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. Allow me to leave it at that. My dad was so good at storytelling. We didn't own a television set those days. Not even a radio, but before we went to bed, 
He would gather us around us kids and tell us the stories from the Old Testament. And I loved him telling us this story of David and Goliath. And I'm aware that there are people here that have told this story better than I can ever tell. Now, this is happening after the fallout of Saul. And they've heard that the Philistines have taken advantage of the situation and they held it that direction. Because that hey, that this man had just become something else. He had become unfit with his tantrums. That train of hallucinations that he used to have all the time. Leading him to go and seek audience with mediums. Sometimes Jesse would send his son David to go and soothe him with the strings of this instrument. So they heard that the Philistines had moved eastward, winding up towards the stream along the flow of Ella Valley, and their objective was to split Israel into two. And the Philistines had become so dead dangerous at war. Now here they came on one mountain, the Philistines were gathered, and on the other mountain, the Israelites were gathered. And then the kind of fighting that they were to engage in was one-to-one -one combat. One man representing the army and the other one representing the other army and the two were to meet down the valley. And the Bible says, then came a giant. You know, when Joshua had gone to defeat those giants, he left only the giants in the three cities. And this is where Gorath and the other giants were coming from. Gorath was, you know, when you look at his height, he was like 2.74 meters tall. 2.74 meters high. Um, less with 1.03 meters. So you add the 1.03 meters on top of my head, that is where Gorath was. So you'll be looking at him like that. That's how so the guy was, check him out, full of salvage insolence, brute strength. He had a coat of mail made of brass, laid over one after the other, and they were like scales of fish. He had brass here, brass there, brass everywhere. That weighed about 35.38 kgs. You would not call him iron man. You would call him brass man. On his legs, he had bronze greaves. A bronze javelin was slung on his back and he had a spear shaft. And in the morning and the evening, the Bible says his voice was heard. In a loud, boastful, bravado blood style, he poured torrents of abuse to provoke Israel. In fact, he scheduled his torments right in the time when Israel was in prayers. When Israel was offering its morning prayers, they would just hear the voice of, of Goliath. And in the evening, as they were offering their evening prayers, it would be punctured with the voice of Goliath. Now, the geographical setting was that they were on one mountain and others were on the other mountain and Goliath who deliberately come down the mountain. He would descend the mountain and get to the valley. And when he gets to the valley, he shouts in a loud voice. And when he shouts, it's like the, array, the geographical arrangement amplified his voice. So when he shouted out, there was the recurring of his voice. When he says, Israel, like some preacher said, when he said, Israel, it was like, Israel, 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 Israel. Israel, 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 Israel. Because his voice would go in one mountain, hit that mountain and bounce back into the other mountain and then it causes a recalling of the voice. When he speaks once, they would be like hearing him speaking three times. Israel, 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 Israel. Now, he had been saying that, doing that, 
for a long time, in the morning and in the evenings. And in verse 12, the Bible says, David comes on the scene. Don't miss the point here. If you think I'm talking about David, the king. No, I'm talking about David, the shepherd boy. You know where he was born? Where he was coming from? He was coming from Bethlehem. You see the connection? He is coming from Bethlehem. Why? Because he is the shepherd boy. Why? Because he is the prototype. He is the sample. The type of the divine David that was also to come from Bethlehem. The one that was to be called the great shepherd born in the manger in the name of Jesus Christ. And David comes to the wall with bread, ten loaves of bread given him by his father to give his brothers and their commander. Now, there's something striking here. He's coming from Bethlehem with bread. And you know, Bethlehem simply means house of bread. So you can eat all stuff for food out there. But you can never find spiritual nourishment as you find when you come to church. So David goes to the scene and then he hears the voice, Israel, Israel, Israel. And the boy says, what's happening? What's that? And they tell him, he's been doing this thing for 40 days now. 40 what? 40 days. He's been insulting us. He's been disparaging us. Now what comes to your mind when we talk about 40 days? What comes to your mind when we talk about 40 days of torment? I'm sure you're thinking about the desolate places. You're thinking about the wilderness. Now, David comes to the wilderness, to this mountain, after he had been anointed as king. Jesus, upon confirmation, through baptism, that he was the king of kings, went into the wilderness 40 days. He wrestled in there. 40 days he was tormented by the devil. 40 days the devil challenged him and insulted him. You see that? Familiar sins, desolate places, wilderness. That's what happened when Jesus went in the wilderness there. The devil came to him. It was like a boxing fight. Jesus in one corner of the ring. And the devil in the other corner of the ring. And probably Jesus is wearing red and white trunks. And the devil is in black trunks. Why red and white? Because Jesus has come to impart in us, impute in us his righteousness. His blood made the devil a public spectacle when he died on the cross. So Jesus is in the wilderness. And I imagine it like it's a boxing fight. And he's there with the Holy Spirit as his trainer. The devil and his courts are there. And as they are there, I can imagine the bell rings. Round one. And the devil comes to Jesus. As he comes to Jesus, you can imagine the slipping and the dodging, the ducking and the bobbing and all the stuff that happens in the boxing fight. So as the devil goes to Jesus, he's trying to throw punches at Jesus and he says to Jesus, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. I don't want you to lose what I'm trying to say here. We're talking about Bethlehem, the house of bread. We're talking about David taking bread to his brothers. We're talking about Jesus in the wilderness and he's called to turn stones into bread. Now it's like you're asking the baker if he's able to bake bread. Because Jesus himself is the bread. He doesn't need bread. Jesus himself is strategically pressed there so that we know that when we are in pain, he is the painkiller. So that we know that when we are thirsty, Jesus is the living water. That when we are hungry, we should know that Jesus is the bread of life. He is the father to the fatherless. He is the helper to the helpless. He is the home to the homeless. In according to the God, with a definite article there, the God. Moses called him as a cloud in the night and a shade in the day. 
Joshua called him the commander of the heavenly host. And David called him the shepherd with a road. Isaiah called him the lord of hosts. Jeremiah called him the king of glory. And Matthew called him Emmanuel, God with us. John called him the word, the living word of God, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. Paul called him the chief cornerstone and the head of the church. A friend of mine on Facebook called him the vessel of hope. And I call him when I'm lost that he is Jehovah Ra. And when I'm sick, I call him as Jehovah Rapha. And when I'm in need, I call him Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Shama, Jehovah and his El Shaddai are his names. So David took bread just like Jesus is the bread from Bethlehem. I heard you people sing a song saying, bread of heaven, feed me too. I want no more. And so Jesus answered the devil. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. And I can see Gabriel just down the canvas there, hitting the canvas, encouraging Jesus. Look him up, look him up, square him up, square him up, square him up, cross him, uppercuts, uppercuts. And Jesus comes to the devil. He follows him with all those punches he's hitting at the devil. He tells him, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the traitors. And then he comes again to the devil. He says, you get away from me, Satan. And the devil comes down to the canvas. And that was the end of the devil. Let's go back to the valley. In the valley, we find giants. In the valley, we find all sorts of geeks. Nades, metals, and, and champions of all sorts. They are good at what they do. Their acolytes actually can shut you up and down. That when you see these giants in the valley, they shut down. They eat up your self-esteem. These champions are everywhere. We have them here. These champions are everywhere. We have them there. Um, champions are everywhere. Grath is everywhere. He brandishes blades of unemployment, abandonment, sexual abuse and divorce, abusive relationships. Goliath is everywhere. He shows his accolades. He prances through your office, your bedroom, your sitting room. He brings bills you cannot settle. He brings grades you cannot make. He brings folks you cannot please. He brings liquor you cannot abstain. He brings pornography you cannot resist. Goliath is everywhere. He brings a career you cannot escape. He brings a past you cannot shake off. He brings a future you cannot face. Goliath is everywhere. And so you know too well when he rose, when he says, Israel, is he all you hear? Is he all you see? Listen, friends, I want to tell you something. I came driving about 65 kilometers away from home to come and tell you that you can be a giant slayer. It doesn't matter what you've gone through in your life. You today can be a giant slayer. All you need is to position yourself to know that he that is in you is greater than he that is outside you. You need, to, as you come to the end of the year, to realize that you can stand up to your Goliath. They've looked at that Goliath. You can look at your Goliath. It can be your health situations. It can be financial issues. Whatever your Goliath is today, you can stand up and face that Goliath. And you can be a giant slayer. I don't know what your Goliath is, brothers and sisters. But that was my Goliath. You don't look at Goliath as much as he looks. Don't look at how gigantic he is. Don't pay attention to his pawns. Jesus had a Goliath when he came. His Goliath was not to die. His Goliath was not to die. Did you hear me right? Jesus Goliath was not death, but life. He made sure that he had to die. And the devil knew that if Jesus died, he had been squared up down. So he made sure that Jesus should give up dying. Hence, he delayed his death. Hence, he tortured him. Hence, he taunted him. 
In fact, Jesus so decided to die. His giant, his Goliath, was busy popping up. Don't die. The devil and his cohorts came into his ears and they were popping up, almost defending him. Don't die. Don't die. Don't die. Until Jesus said, it is done. He had first his Goliath. When he said, Father, in your hands I commit my spirit. Now, friends of mine, you need to understand and read the story of David and Goliath because giants sneer in our neighborhood. Giants of rejection. Giants of failure. They're so real. The struggle is real. Maybe because of a lack of education, that has become a giant to you. Maybe you've been praying for a marriage partner that has been a giant to you. Maybe you've been asking for a child from God and that has been a giant to you. Let me tell you something. Probably you've been diagnosed with such a, a disease that is incurable and that has been a giant to you. Let me tell you something, friends. When David came to the scene, he didn't ask about Goliath's height. He didn't ask about Goliath's IQ. He didn't ask the weight of the spear. He didn't ask for a dossier on the war experience of Goliath. He didn't ask any of those things. Because there is a weakness in every giant. There is an exaggeration in every giant. I want to tell you that there is a fear in every giant. They say fear is false evidence appearing real. Giants are not what they are. When David looked at giant, he didn't look at all the mechanism and everything that made him a giant. David was busy looking at the weaknesses in that giant. And he saw them. He, he singled them out. When he heard the giant speak to him saying, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And David says, that's his weakness. Because I am carrying a staff, only one stick. And the guy says, I come to him with two sticks. David saw that Goliath had a blared vision. You know, people that have gone to school, they tell us that people that are so gigantic have a certain imbalance in hormones that result into them having a blared vision and having unstable movements. So David sees that weakness in this giant. He says, as much as he's huge, he cannot see properly. And then David sees another problem. This giant is coming with a helper, an assistant, with a shield. Now if he's too strong, why should he have a helper? Why should he have a helper, an assistant? David sees that as a weakness. He sees that this man has poor sight. He sees that this man can't see properly. That's why he has a shield. He has somebody to protect him. And David says, this guy has a problem with sight that when I sling the stone at a speed of 0 0.3 handgun, he will not see that stone. He will not duck from that stone. He will not veer from that stone. I'm going to pull him down. So, he goes after him. The giant, he sees another problem. The giant says, come to me. He tells David, come to me. And David sees that as a problem. This guy cannot walk stably. He is unstable. That's why he's moving and walking like a robot. He's like a robocop. He is not so swift. He's not so fast. The guy is so poor that even when David had changed the strategy of war, the guy could not yet see it. He was still waiting for one-on-one -on -one combat. Yet David had changed his strategy. Let me tell you something, friends. Giants are not what we think they are. They are not what we think they are. With David, he realized that no matter how big this giant is, I know in whom I believe. David, the guy who was the eighth son, who had once married eight wives. I want to tell you, friends, that in the book of First Samuel chapter 17, reading on 26, reading on 36, 45, 46, and 47, he mentions the name of God eight times. He knew the power of God. He knew the power of God. He knew that God is almighty and is ready to intervene in the affairs of his people anytime. That's why he called him the almighty God, the mightiest warrior. 
You remember the time when Joshua was about to get into Jericho? He saw a commander. He saw a warrior with a suede and a shield. And he went to him and said, are you with us or for our adversaries? And that warrior said, neither, but I am a commander of the heavenly host. Now I have come. He was the superintendent himself who had come. He was the superintendent general himself who had come. The one that is in charge of the entire universe, the affairs of mankind. He that superintends about the sun's momentum as it moves in the sphere. He that is in charge of regulating the heat and light that comes to this earth. He is the one that superintends this earth as it moves in its trajectory, that it does not misbehave, even as it moves at 1,000 kilometers per hour, that it should not misbehave and lose balance so that it balances up with force of gravity so that you and me, when we are walking about, we do not feel dizzy or like having light heads like we're going to fall. He, the superintendent, comes in this life. He, the superintendent, comes in your life. He, the superintendent, comes in my life. He, the superintendent, says, now I have come. When you are facing divorce, the superintendent says, now I have come. When you are facing all sorts of problems, he says, now I have come. David mentions him in all the eight passages that have come and is emphasizing that he is Yahweh, the one that has dealt with his people, right from the antediluvian to the patricks and to the law. He, the God, called the Elohim, that is in no competition with anyone or anything. You don't need to bother when people try to bring their small gods to compete with this God because he stands out and is not in any controversy, he's not in any competition with anyone. This God stands out. The almighty oh God, the mightiest warrior that stands between his people. And he says, now I have come. Whatever your situation in your life, he says, I've come. It could be sickness. He says, the superintendent general now has come. It could be failures of 2019. He says, the superintendent general now has come. It could be your fears for 2020. He says, now the superintendent has come. When Jesus is in the vessel, we say we can smile at the storm. When they were in their boat, paddling their boat. These were men of experience that lived most of their lives on the water than off the water. And then a storm came. And when a storm came, they tried with their skills to stabilize it. They tried all they could to stabilize it until they failed. Even when they went to shake Jesus up, they were not asking Jesus to help them out. They were in short time Jesus Surely you're going to die in a sleep? You, I mean, you're going to sleep like that and die in a sleep? They are not going to Jesus to ask for help because these were men that we experienced. These were champions on the waters. And that failed and they gave up on life. But they cared that this gentleman sleeping there should see his death. And when they shook him up, they said, Master, tell us thou not that we perish. And when Jesus woke up, he was more confused about their waking him up suddenly and not about the situation surrounding them. And when he looked at the waters and he looked at them and he pointed his finger on his mouth and he shh, shh. The waters remembered when they saw him, they remembered this is he, the superintendent. This is he, the creator. He that said we come into existence and we came. It is he that is standing to shut us up. Like a dog when it sees a stranger and starts making noise, barking here and there. And suddenly it sees that actually the stranger is with its master. And you see the dog killing its tail under there. And the storms, when they saw Jesus, they killed down their tails and they came down to nothingness and there was peace on the waters. 
What is your problem, brothers and sisters? What is it that is troubling you, but it makes you hopeless and helpless? What is it that when you experience it, you feel like when you're praying to God, your prayers are popping up and down. They are bouncing back and forth off your ceiling and cannot proceed to God to God. What is it that makes you fold and shrink in your face? I want to tell you something, friends, that there is a great God. He has given that power to be in you. He's given you that power to stand up against your giants. You better stand up with the story of David and speak to your problems and tell them that now I stand because the commander, the superintendent general has now come. He's come in my life. He's going to calm the storms of my life. There is nothing that God can fail. As I wind up, I know there are kids in here probably who are struggling with all issues of life. Trying to be better kids. The more they try, the worse they feel they become. And they feel so frustrated. I don't know if I've shared this story. For the sake of the kids. On that Sabbath morning, here is my turning point. On Sabbath that morning, I'm alone, my brothers, and come for lunch. And I'm all by myself, grudgingly eating that food, tasteless food. Then I turned just beside the table. There was Arthur Maxwell, volume 9. I started grow, going through, I didn't know how to read, but I was going through the pictures of volume 9 where Jesus' death is displayed. And I see the mother crying as she holds the feet that we had filled with those long spikes. And without realizing it, I was shedding tears. And I said right on my table, God, if indeed Jesus came to die wicked people like me, look at me. Dad has spanked me. Mama has spanked me. They have failed me. Change me and change me now. Now that was a turning point for my life. That it, it doesn't matter what your child has gone through in his life. What your child is going through in her life, I want to tell you when you present that child to Jesus, Jesus will change that child. When you present that child to Jesus, Jesus will turn that child upside down. When you present that child to Jesus, Jesus will turn that child through 180 degrees. What was good becomes bad, and what was bad becomes good. What was black becomes white, and white was white becomes black. Jesus is in the business of changing people. I know that your children are little giants in those houses. They give you high blood pressure. They make you regret and say things that you should be saying to your children. But let me tell you on this day that God is able, the superintendent, the great commander that puts things in place, is able to change the course of the life of your child. It doesn't matter how long it's going to take. You may die and not see that change, but I can testify to you today that God is too able. That each time I fall into sin, I remember that story and I quickly run to Jesus. Each time I fall into sin, I'm put down into sin and the devil reminds me of my past. I look up to Jesus, the author and sustainer of my eternal salvation and say, he is too able. He can change your life. He can change your life. It doesn't matter what you're going through in your life. I am here to tell you that Jesus can change your life. I don't care the champions that are in your life. Littered all over. All over your life. I don't care who they are. What they are. I want to tell you that Jesus is able to make you a giant slayer. And your life will never be the same again. I want to pray for somebody. You want me to pray for you? Because you sang to say, strong deliverer, be thou still my strength and shield. Let's close our eyes as I pray. Father, I thank you for the story of David and Goliath. Many times we see champions in our lives. People that shut us up and down and puncture our surface team. We thank you for Jesus. He had an experience 40 days in the wilderness. We thank you for David because he had an experience with Goliath. And what we know this day is that with you in the vessel, 
we can smile at the storms. We can smile at the giants. Give us the power and the strength to stand up against our giants. Whatever our failures were in 2019, may they be packed in our past. So that we look up to Jesus, the author and sustainer of our eternal salvation. Lift us up and we shall stand. We look forward to that day when the saints will go marching in through the star-studded corridor of Orion, the living starship, and look to the city whose builder and maker is God, the author and sustainer of our eternal salvation. Because the church does sing that there is a fountain filled with blood. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins, we are seen as plunged beneath that blood. Loose all their guilty stains. We thank you, Jesus. Sin cannot be a giant anymore. We can face it with the blood of Jesus. And our lives will be shielded even by your grace. We thank you for everything. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.